you. I don't need. Okay. Oh yeah. Hello. Are you guys like uh, you all got your food? You're happy? Okay. <laughs> So yeah, so hi, I'm Abhilash and I'm the creator of Bass Uncle. Um, it used to be like a very side project when I was still uh, with Nanning and Levadi at Trade Gecko, but now it's like our own company and we're building chatbots for other people as well. Um, so I'm just gonna run through with you a little bit about uh, how I created Bass Uncle, a little bit of the technical stuff as well, and uh, a little bit about the design stuff as well. So just a little bit about everything. but. I want you guys to feel free, like you can just jump in whenever you want and ask me any questions, like anytime. So let's just start with like how it all started, right? So um, I was at a bus stop one day, right, at Orchard Road, just like all these people. I was standing there with my head turned right, waiting for the bus, and I just kept thinking to myself, like, um, how long do I need to wait? So I was just thinking how long I, have to, I, I needed to wait, but all these uncles and aunties had their own problems as well, right? They went shopping and then they're all saying they're waiting all day, they have to go back and like eat food at home or something. So um, it's a very simple problem. I was just standing there and asking myself how long I needed to wait. And uh, Singapore being a really advanced country actually has all these electronic bots at bus stops that actually literally tells you how long you have to wait for the buses. So they give you a list of all these buses and their arrival times. So on that day, I could just look at the back and then I'd know how long I'd have to wait. And there are also a lot of apps available. Um, you can just go in the app store, search for SG bus or something. You get a bunch of apps, hundreds maybe, that give you like these little interfaces that uh, kind of tell you how long you needed to wait for your bus, right? But on that one day when I was just standing there, um, I felt that all this information was a little too overwhelming, right? In my head, I just wanted to ask one question. I just wanted to, I just asked myself, um, I wish I can ask someone how long I have to wait. So if I looked at this board here, there's just too much information. There's like, I don't know, you count the number of numbers on this board, you'd, you'd be like blown up, right? I mean, you'd actually have to look for your bus and find out how long you have to wait. And even with the app, they all have their own nice little interface, but it, you, there's a fair amount of scrolling and a fair I mean, a lot of information in these apps that's very unnecessary. In my head, I just wanted to know this. I had to wait seven minutes. So that's when I decided maybe I can try to build something that can just tell me this, seven minutes. And that was actually what inspired the creation of Bus Uncle. So uh, for those of you who don't know Bus Uncle, it's a Facebook Messenger chatbot who's really, really quirky tells you about your bus arrival timings and uh, directions to go anywhere in Singapore. Uh, if you don't want to listen to me talk, I might get really boring. You can just chat with Bus Uncle. It's probably a lot more funnier than me. Uh, you can actually go to this link and just talk straight to Bus Uncle. I'll give you a little intro of what Bus Uncle can do today. <coughs> How people chat with Bus Uncle, right? So the moment you start your chat with Bus Uncle, you just say hello and he'd reply with an app, right? And uh, You'd have a button there called Bus How Long. Naturally, you'd want to click on it. And as, as you click on it, you're taken through this little user journey while chatting with Bus Uncle. And you can actually tell Bus Uncle like, which bus you're waiting for. Then he'd tell you how long you have to wait. So right here, I said Bus 10. And he said, you got 10 minutes. Go get groceries. So the, the chat you see on the right is actually a longer form of conversation that people have with Bus Uncle. Usually, the first time they chat with Bus Uncle, they go through a really long journey like this. But because Bus Uncle uh, does, does not really follow a linear flow, people nowadays just say, hey, Uncle, Bus 10, Orchard, how long? Then he just say, 10 minutes, go get groceries. It's a much shorter form. But this is generally like a good introduction to how people use Bus Uncle. You can also get like transport information. So you can ask Bus Uncle, how can I get to NUS? Uh, it's very similar to what you can do on Google Maps and City Mapper. Um, this actually wasn't intended as a feature in the earlier days, but a lot of people, when they're messaging Bus Uncle in the earliest days, would always ask him this. So eventually, we didn't have a choice, right? Our users wanted this, so eventually we had to go and implement this. So, um, so now you can actually ask Bus Uncle how to get to wherever you want in Singapore, and it gives you like information, like all public transport information, including trains, even though it's just Bus Uncle. Uh, and uh, what's, what's fun is uh, you can get like step-by-step -step directions on how to get anywhere. 
with little maps for every single step of the journey as well. And I guess what makes it a little more interesting than other apps is you can try to be natural with it, right? So if you tell Bus Uncle when you're searching for directions you're, you're late, he actually gets you the fastest way to get somewhere. You can actually even tell him, I'm feeling very lazy today or I'm very tired. And he'll find you the way that where you don't have to walk as much or you don't have to make a lot of transfers. So it's very natural in a way. Um, you can also get bus locations. So one thing we realized from our users was uh, when they're waiting for their buses, everyone would be like, where, where, where? Right? They just constantly keep asking where, where, where? And uh, then we realized, OK, maybe we have this information from APIs available. Let's just put where. So now you can ask where is the bus, and he gives you a location. And uh, you also get transport updates. So you, Singapore, being a very, very small country, always has all these reroutes that happen throughout the year for all these big events. So one of this, these events is called F1, Formula One. And whenever Formula One comes in, uh, a lot of public transport has to be rerouted around the tracks. And normally when they're reroutes, uh, these buses get intercepted. So a lot of people can't actually use their public transport how they normally would. So Bus Uncle actually gives you that information. Like you say, I'm waiting for bus 16, then he'd be like, hey, it's affected by F1. Like. And then uh, he'd give you a, like an affected bus list that you can actually click on and learn more about it as well. Yeah, so that's a little bit about um, Bus Uncle, like an introduction. Uh, now I'll go through more of like a super basic introduction of how to build a bot or how to build a chatbot, right? How many of you here are technical people, like know how to code? Okay, uh, quite, f quite a fair bit of you. Okay, uh, so that's good. And what I'm going to show you is like super, super basic stuff. So this is like really, really basic compared to all the supervised machine learning and all that stuff you've, been, you've probably been dabbling around at home. So uh, you can ask me questions about that later. So normally when people think about building a bot, uh, people think it's a little complex. I need to learn machine learning. I need to master my linguistics. Like I need to know exactly what vo vocabulary to use and stuff like that. So a lot of people in Singapore are actually scared to build chatbots because they're scared, scared people will talk to their chatbot in Singlish. <laughs> right? So people are like, I need to master my linguistics and stuff. And finally, I need to practice my algorithm so that the bot like fully is able to go through all these nonlinear flows and give you the answers you want. Uh, many people think that this is a huge barrier, but the thing is when you build a bot, you don't really need to do any of this actually because you don't need to do it yourself because there are hundreds and hundreds of tools available that do all this stuff for you, give you a very simple interface to use and you can go build a bot in like five to 10 minutes. But, but don't build a bot in five to 10 minutes. Like, when you read online how to build a bot in five to 10 minutes, those are really the worst chatbots you can build in the world. So yeah, so I mean, you can just start, I guess. Um, I'll talk a bit about like natural language processing, right? It's kind of uh, this, this subcategory of AI that deals with how computers understand human language. And uh, naturally, when you build a chatbot, your chatbot needs to understand human language. So a lot of natural processing, natural language processing is involved. There are two tools that are available that are pretty good for you to start off with building chatbots. One is called wit.ai. It got acquired by Facebook in 2014, and one is called Dialogflow. It got acquired by Google in 2017. So you choose, Facebook or Google. Which one you like, just choose one. Um, so just choose one. And how it works, natural language processing, is very, very simple. As a human, it, it always assumes that a human is asking a chatbot a question. And the chatbot has to give a human an answer. That's it. That's natural language processing to you in its simplest forms. And um, when you think about how this, this works in deeper uh, retrospect, um, you'd realize all it has to boil down is the bot has to give you the correct answer. And that's it. That's all natural language processing has to solve. So I'll talk about a bit of the basics about it, I guess. So let, firstly, we can talk about utterance, right? And utterance is kind of the free text of a question that a, a human asks a bot. So the term they use for this in, in all these NLP tools is called utterance. And uh, utterances are literally just text you send to the bot, like raw text, unprocessed, that, get, that the bot gets straight directly from the user. So for bus uncle, some of the utterances that people send are something like, hey, where the bus? Don't see anything. Like, how long more? 
like all this stuff. Some people even say liar, right? Liar, where are you? So these are like utterances. Then we have intents. So an intent is kind of like the topic of a question. Um, there can be hundreds of thousands or millions of utterances, but generally they're always categorized in, in, these, in these classes called intents. And intents generally just mean what's the intention of the user. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's quite obvious. So uh, when users say, how long do I need to wait for a bus? The intent in the back to the chatbot is something called get bus time. So there can be 100 utterances, but there can be only two intents. So one intent maps to many utterances, and uh, many utterances map to a single intent, generally. And then you also have this concept called entity. An entity is kind of like a useful word or phrase from a question. So when people message bus uncle something like, I'm at 187946 near Rochor, and or they ask him bus 65 at Orchard, how long? The entities are the useful phrases, or the useful words or phrases from these questions that bus uncle would need in order to process the information. So entities here are postal code, which is 187946. Another entity is bus number 65, and another entity is place Orchard. So it just means useful stuff. And finally, when, you, when everyone's talking about AI, machine learning, again, it's all about confidence levels, right? The difference between AI and normal programming is AI is dumb. So you need to make it smart. But normal programming is either a yes or no. So you, you have to make it smart. Um, but for AI, it generally means that you constantly need to train it. And as you train it, you increase its confidence levels. So a confidence level is the probability that a deduced intent or entity is actually correct. So one example is um, when a user is t telling Bas Uncle, hey, waiting damn long la. Um, the intent derived from Bas Uncle was actually get bus time, but it wasn't with 100% confidence. Because waiting damn long la doesn't, know, I mean, doesn't very directly translate to get bus time. So in the back, this intent was uh, deduced with an 87.5% confidence. So that's kind of like the first part of natural language, natural language processing. The first part of natural language processing deals with NLU, natural language understanding. So processing comes after the understanding, right? So um, a user sends an utterance to a, the, the bot. The bot deduces intents and entities. And the moment it deduces these intents and entities, it does something important. That does something important is in a little black box, and that's where that NLP stuff actually happens. It processes that information. <coughs> um, so when a user said something like, I'm waiting for a bus, what happened was um, the user sent bus uncle something, and now they're waiting for a reply. Bus uncle deduced the intents and the entities from here, and it took the useful information like bus number and station number, and sent this, these useful entities to Singapore Land Transport Authority APIs. Right? LTA has a bunch of open data sets or real-time APIs that are available. So this stuff gets sent right to LTA. And uh, the correct information we need from LTA gets sent back to Bus Uncle. So it's the waiting time is actually sent directly back to Bus Uncle. And uh, essentially, now Bus Uncle can communicate this waiting time back to the user. This is what natural language processing is. right? But one thing we did different in Bus Uncle was we said, hey, let me make this sound funny. Right? So uh, we don't really want to tell the user two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. It's so boring. Like, we, that'll, be, that'll just be like an app then. Right? I mean, if a user is chatting with Bus Uncle, why not make it fun? Why not make it interesting? So Bus Uncle generally always says, let me make this sound funny. And he replies back to the user saying, still seven minutes. Go make soft boiled egg right? with something funny. And that's essentially how every request to Bus Uncle gets sent and response is received back to the user. Um, so machine learning comes into play when this goes to scale, right? So there are hundreds of thousands of users who use Bus Uncle every day. And uh, essentially, when, as these users you talk to Bus Uncle, they send in a lot of utterances. They send in free text to Bus Uncle all the time. This girl can send 283, this guy can send 46. And uh, as the bot receives more in utterances, the bot kind of deduces more intents and entities using these systems in the back. And as it deduces more intents and entities, the bot increases its own confidence levels. 
And that's when, what we mean by when we say a chatbot is getting smarter, or it's self-learning, or it gets smarter over time. You've probably heard like millions of people speak about AI, mostly salespeople, not really programmers, <laughs> who, sp who speak about AI and say um, uh, it gets smarter over time or it's self-learning. This is actually what they mean in the back. So, so Bus Uncle receives about like 60,000 utterances. Uh, this was actually a while ago. Yeah, but about 60,000 utterances every single day. So it gets trained quite a lot, and the confidence levels of Bus Uncles is pretty high, actually. So that's, there. that's him thinking to himself, I damn smart ho. And that's supposed to be like a, a nerdy glass emoji, but I don't think the PowerPoint is showing it. Um, OK, so that's a bit about like the, the technical stuff of it. right? I'll go a bit into uh, the UX side of things and the design side of things as well. So when we build chatbots, we kind of have to build for people. A lot of, pe a lot of developers don't really realize that. Most developers uh, get super excited about AI. They start focusing on uh, things like, um, I don't know, recurrent neural networks and supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and they get super technical and stuff. But most developers themselves aren't really exposed to how their products are used with people, right? And that's where product managers and designers and all these other guys also come in to help improve that experience. So. The characteristics of people when they're chatting with bots um, is we've boiled it down to like three main characteristics. One is people like to be natural. So when you're chatting with a chat bot, you never ask the person to tell you exactly what to say. So if a chat bot tells a per person press cancel to do this or press stop to do this, it's a bad chat bot because you don't really want to direct the person to use the chatbot, you rather want the person to be natural. So that's one thing you got to remember when designing chatbots. Number two is um, people are always inspired or, or they, they stick to some kind of culture around them. So this is, this is everywhere. This is not only geographic culture like in Singapore, like it's not only Singlish or stuff, it could be, be any kind of uh, community that the person in, that the person is in. They're kind of inspired by this community when they use the language. Um, are there any gamers here? Gamers? Yeah. So, so normally, as you gamers, when you play multiplayer with each other, you chat with each other, right? But the language you use to chat with each other is probably like a lot of swearing and, uh, and a lot of like small words. And you just try to be like very on point. You're kind of inspired by that gaming culture as well. So culture just means they're in inspired by some kind of aura around how they're supposed to use the bot. And finally, when people use chatbots, they like to participate. Very simply put, they like to add value to the conversation. So if a person says, hi, and the chatbot says, oh, hey, I'm this bot. I like to do this. I can do this. I can do that. I can do that as well. The person's not really participating there. The person, your user will get turned off, and then they'll leave the chatbot. So always design your chatbot so that people can participate as frequently as possible. Um, and, and then that's kind of how people actually use chat, right? They like to participate. So people are not robots. Um, when you design for chatbots, uh, you don't really just think about what the chatbot can do. You don't really think about what's its utility. Rather, you've got to think about how people use messaging apps in general. People use messaging apps not only to ask questions, but they also emit expressions, and they also like to be cooperative. A lot of chatbot developers, you'll realize that um, soon as you launch your bot, people actually start saying things like, thank you. And they start saying things like, good morning, or hope, hope you have a good day. Or, or in Bas Uncle's case, they even ask, like, have you had dinner? Have you had lunch? And all this random stuff. So they're not really questions. They're not really, they don't really just want to use the chatbot, but they like to be natural and express themselves. So they're inspired by feelings, experiences, and most importantly, randomness. Like, you can never expect what people do. They're very, very random. Um, so when, when designing the user experience, or, or generally the, the flows of chatbots, you've got to remember what people can actually do. So uh, Bas Uncle actually took into consideration quite a lot of these things. And now Bas Uncle has launched on I guess three messaging apps so far on Messenger, Telegram, and the Google Assistant. We'll be launching some more soon, right? 
Um, so some learnings from Bas Uncle. Um, what made Bas Uncle so successful? Uh, we've been able to boil it down to, I, I guess, three points. Uh, one is a unique personality. So when we built the chatbot Bas Uncle, we didn't really say this is a tool that helps people do things. Rather, we, we tried to say this is a person that people already know of, the super old grumpy uncle in Singapore who likes to sit down at Kopi Tiams and drink Kopi, allow her drink beer, and likes to like, scold people as well in, in very, very fluent English. So we are super inspired by this, uh, this persona, and we actually uh, Im uh, directly translated it into the chatbot. Secondly, um, Bas Angle has a nonlinear conversational flow, which is, uh, I think, one of the most important things you got to remember when designing bots. So normally, I mean, uh, how many, I mean, has everyone here used a chatbot before? Yes, kind of, maybe, OK. So most chatbots, you might have realized, are very linear, right? They tell the user, hi, I can do this. Please click on A or B. And the user has to click on A or B. And if the user, I mean, that's after the user clicks on A, then the bot says, oh, A, OK. Now can you click on uh, C and D? I mean, C or D, and the user has to click on C or D. This is a very linear kind of flow, right? It goes from one point of the conversation to another point. And generally, these are bad experiences because people are not really used to being directed when using the chatbot. Um, I mean, if, if a chatbot does this to people, they might as well just get the chatbot to be like an automated voice dialer, right? Like, you know, all those automated voice dialers you call, they say, please press one, or, please press two. Yeah, those are pretty much what we want to stray away from, very, very far away from. So you want to build for nonlinear, which means um, you want to try to make the chatbot be able to answer the person no matter what they ask. So uh, try not to launch a linear chatbot as a huge new thing. And finally, what made Bas Uncle so successful is he gives you answers, very, very simply put. Just gives you answers. Um, People ask how long they have to wait. He gives them the, uh, the answer, five minutes. They ask how to get to, uh, to I don't know, Changi Airport. He gives them the directions. So a lot of chatbots, when you speak to them, you realize they don't really give you answers. They, they say, oh, I think you're talking about this. And uh, do you mean this? Or do you mean that? Or could you please rephrase your question? Um, those chatbots don't really give you answers. A lot of people stray away from those. Not really nice. Yeah, so we're also building like many, many more chatbots for other people. So we've built Heritage Granny for the National Heritage Board. We have a travel chatbot in Medan called Ketchup. And um, we are la launching our next chatbot uh, in the middle of next month, soon as well. Uh, so that's us. That's Bas Uncle. This is our website. You can just go here, chat with Bas Uncle, and ask me any questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So in the so the question was um, uh, the bot learns more and more over time by getting lots and lots of utterances. So who labels these utterances, right? Um, in the earlier days, it's actually the developers or the product managers who actually kind of have to label these utterances, but. If you use the tools like wit.ai and Dialogflow, uh, these tools actually learn from what you're labeling. Right? They, they learn from you labeling these utterances as well. A month later, after, lab after doing some labeling work, the tool itself automatically starts labeling them as well. Um, and how, but is it possible that get, uh, the tool gets it wrong? Yes. Yeah. So it's definitely possible that the tool can get it wrong. Um, so you do have to keep monitoring your logs, you do have to keep monitoring like what your systems are actually deducing as intents and entities. Um, but it's uh, like as you launch it, you monitor it for a while, like you be very hands on with it for maybe a month or a couple of months. After you realize that the tool is getting it right for, for some time, you can just lay off. Like right now, I, I haven't looked at the bus angle code based in like a few months already. I'm, I'm quite confident it's labeling correctly. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, regarding the style, you say when it sees no appearance, then it will review the intent and NTP, right? Mm -hmm. Does it mean it's an error intention or error NTP? 
that you will leave you? Sorry, could you repeat the last part? Because just now you mentioned that when Fast Under receives more material, then mm -hmm. you will reduce the intention and entity. Yes, correct. What does this mean? It's an error intention. Uh, a, a error, error intention. Error. Because oh, oh, oh. from what I see, it seems okay. like you will add more intent right. or entity where it receives more material. OK, so yeah, so the question was, um, uh, as Bas Uncle deduces more intents and entities, what happens when they deduce like errors in intents and entities, right? Uh, so normally what happens is you go back to the tool and then you invalidate it. So you, you see what the, the chatbot deduced, you see what the system deduced, and it might be wrong. But when you, go, when you see something is wrong, you actually invalidate it. So you literally tell the system, this is wrong. Don't deduce something like this again. So you reduce its confidence level of deducing the wrong thing. And then you, by, deducing, by reducing the confidence level of deducing the wrong things, you increase the confidence levels of deducing the right things in general. Yeah. Yes? Right, yeah, so uh, the question was, um, how do you deal with adversary inputs, right? Like people saying gibberish and trying to ch train your chatbot wrong. Number one is you don't make your system 100% AI driven. The moment you make your system 100% AI driven, um, that kind of allows that, that, that opportunity to ha take place. So I'm not sure how many of you know about Microsoft's Tay, yeah? A chatbot that was released like a while ago. Uh, so Tay was it released like with really, really good intentions, right? <laughs> to be like this person that everyone can talk to. But a lot of people started swearing at Tay, like in the <laughs> earliest days. <laughs> so from the next day onwards, Tay started swearing back at all these people. <laughs> because Tay was 100% AI driven. Um, so one thing you want to do is you want to kind of limit your scope. So limit your scope of the intents and entities that are actually possible for the bot to to learn itself. You don't really want it to be able to deduce uh, its own entities or, or intents directly from utterances yet. So what Tay did was uh, Tay derived that what, when people were sending like these swear words to her, she was creating more intents of her own. When people started with, uh, with, like with swears, right? Can I swear? <laughs> yeah, so when people start saying some things like fuck you, right? Um, Tay might have deduced fuck you to be like a greeting, <laughs> right? So, um, <laughs> so, th so the next time Tay started talking to people, she greeted them with that as well. <laughs> yeah, so, so you, you kind of limit your scope. You say, these are my fixed intents and entities in the start. As it gets more successful, I, s I gradually add on more intents and entities. Yes? Can you sense frustration and if so, do you tailor a message? Yes. So the question was, can you sense frustration and do you tailor the message accordingly? Um, when people send these utterances, they actually, in, in its raw form, you can actually deduce sentiments. Right? There are lots of tools available that allow you to determine the sentiment of a user based on a single message they send you. Um, so yes, we can always deter determine like, uh, their frustrations. People who are angry generally tend to use capital letters <laughs> and uh, swear as well. And uh, normally when people are, are, I mean, are frustrated, we actually have an intent in Bas Uncle to handle them. So the intent in the back we use is, is called complaints. So the moment Bas Uncle deduces that a user was frustrated, Bas Uncle deduced the intent was complaint, then he would reply with something like, hey, chill. <laughs> just, just relax, it'll be okay, your bus will arrive on time. Yeah. Yes. Do you know what was the original team structure like when you started working on this product? <laughs> <laughs> Roughly, um, how what was the journey journey like towards the first version of the product? Okay. Um, so yeah. So Nanning's laughing because <laughs> uh, the earliest version was just me. Like it's literally like it was a side project of mine. So I coded out Bas Uncle myself, uh, but. The face and everything, I actually didn't do it myself. I'm not really a, a designer at all. So I got a lot of help from my friend at TradeGecko. Her name is Kyle. She's like one of the best designers I've ever met. So I asked her to, so what, how it worked in the earliest days was I actually coded out Bas Uncle 
properly myself, but without a face. So it's just like a blank face in the start, right? I told my friend Kyle, uh, can you chat with Bus Uncle for a day and then come up with a face of a bus driver? And she was able to come up with that face in like two hours. So until today, we still use that same face that she created in like two hours. Uh, so yeah, the team was just me, and Kyle was kind of like my designer for things. Um, as we got more users, started getting more business, slowly I had to like teach other people what I do, and then that expanded. Now, now it's a three-person full-time and three-person part-time. Yeah. So now uh, I'm I'm kind of no more a developer. <laughs> like I'm very sad. Uh, like in the earliest days, I was always a developer, but now uh, I kind of have to manage the sales, the business development, and fundraising, and accounting, and all this crap. <laughs> so, uh, so now I kind of take care of more of the business stuff. And uh, in my core team, I just have one developer. For my part-timers, I have like copywriters and marketers and designers. Yeah. Is it difficult to transfer to another language? Yeah, so uh, the question was, is it difficult to translate this to another language? So when you translate it to another language, you kind of have to create a whole new set of intents and entities just for that other language. Right now, there's no technology that allows you to use the same intents mapped to multiple languages yet. So if you want to start training it for other languages, you kind of have to redo it from the start in a way. Um, so it's, it's, it's not really difficult, but it's very time consuming right now. If you want to have a chatbot that speaks multiple languages. Yeah. Any more questions? How, yes. Uh, how much training do you have to do if you add intent? How much training do you have? How do you add an intent? Well, uh, if you add an intent, mm -hmm. how much retraining do you have to do? Oh, OK. So the question was, like, if you add an intent, how much more retraining do you have to do? Um, Normally, I just add the intent. I train it with about 10 sentences, 10 utterances myself. Then I push it out. Then normally, the users train it for me. Yeah. How do you monitor the quality? That okay. means how do you evaluate the, the user's feedback, the kind of thing? Right. How do you collect them? Yeah. So the question was, like, how do you monitor the quality and evaluate user's feedback and that kind of thing? Um, so yeah, so this is like super duper important because uh, a lot of what we did was boss uncle was actually not our own ideas. Like we never wanted to add directions. We never wanted to 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 add more jokes either. But a, a lot of users wanted it. And how we actually got to know this was uh, we did we tried to I mean we tried to get two kinds of feedback, quantitative and qualitative feedback. So for quantitative feedback, we use an analytics system in the back. So we use Facebook Analytics right now. Um, and in general, and I mean, if you guys have used analytic systems, you know how they work. You just fire off events, and then you create funnels. So generally, uh, you, you learn about how people traverse through your user journey through this kind of data. Uh, normally, with apps and websites, you fire off events at different points of time. Like for an app, a user might click on one button. You fire off an event saying, user clicked button A. And then the user types in something in the field. Then you fire off something saying user typed into a certain field. Then in the back, you'll kind of get a funnel showing like how many users first typed the button and second typed into this field. Right? That's generally how analytics works. For chatbots as well, it's very, very similar. So depending on the first thing a user says, an intent is deduced. We fire off an event for that intent. Then they say something else, a second intent is deduced. We fire off another event for that intent. Uh, so that's quantitative, um, and we measure like in the back what are the most common things people are saying, what are the where where's the place that people like to drop off, and things like that. So we kind of optimize the flows there. For qualitative, we use our Facebook page. So every chatbot on on Facebook right now actually needs to be deployed on a Facebook page. Um, a lot of people don't realize the value of this Facebook page, but. I, I'm, I'm very glad that, that we were able to like, look at the value of it in the earliest days. We use it as a place to get feedback from users. So we actually ask our users, what more do you want? What do you like? What do you not like? And uh, do you like my jokes? <laughs> and, and, and this stuff. And we actually get users saying, yeah, I want this feature. Or I wish, I, I wish there was a way to store my favorite buses. 
And uh, that's the way we get quality to feedback. Yes. Any other questions? You guys. Let's thank you for this great talk. Thank you.